the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Sunday mornings have us squarely in the Gospel of Mark this year, with the occasional excursion into John or maybe a quick peek in Luke's Gospel now and then. But for the most part, we are going to be in Mark's Gospel on Sunday mornings. And things move quickly in Mark. Mark is the shortest, most succinct gospel. I don't remember how often he uses the word immediately. The Greek term is euthus, and it's not always translated as immediately into English because we don't like quite that much repetition of the same word. In just nine verses in chapter one, the word is used three times. Verse 12, and immediately the spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. In verse 18, Jesus calls Simon and Andrew, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. Then he sees James and John in verse 20, and immediately they, he called them and they left their father. Rarely is there time to pause and reflect in Mark's gospel, to ask yourself, what just happened before Jesus has moved on to the next thing? And today we might want to ask, what just happened? Because as soon as he and his disciples left the synagogue upon finding Simon's mother-in-law sick at home, Jesus simply took her by the hand and lifted her up. You could say he raised her or resurrected her almost, brought her back to not her old life, but a new life with new purpose. Simon's mother-in-law got up and began to serve them. In what way was he serving them? Did she make, did, was she serving them? Did she make them sandwiches and tea and have all the disciples sit down and eat refreshments? It's possible, probably even likely that she did that. That's what women tended to do. But she probably also did more because to serve is what Jesus did. He told his friends that he came not to be served, but to serve. To serve is what disciples do. So maybe Simon's mother-in-law became a believer that day, a disciple herself, not just making and passing out the tea, but listening to Jesus, supporting his ministry, telling others, helping the cause, being involved. Maybe Jesus is lifting her up from her sickbed, changed her whole life. Imagine that. But before we have time to think about what's happened to Simon's mother-in-law, it is suddenly sunset and the whole city has gathered around outside the door. There is Mrs. Jenkins with her arthritis, old Joe's grown son with his bipolar, the street lady that everybody sees pushing a cart but no one knows her name, folks from the clinic, old people, children, asthmatics, cripples, addicts. Looks like the entire town is pushing to get in, clamoring to be made well, made new like she was. Because who wouldn't want that? A strong and healthy body, a clean mind, a chance to start over, an acceptable presence in the community again, to be welcomed and understood and received as who you truly are. We all want that. Jesus made that possible by restoring people to their true selves, by giving them wholeness of life, a renewed spirit and body and personhood, understanding of self and self-worth in relation to the whole world. The gospel woman, Simon's mother-in-law, was healed not only to serve tea and cookies, and that much was fine, but also to bring forth all her gifts, her offerings, her worth, and to bless those around her with her insights, her encouragement, her care, her involvement, her listening, her presence, her input, her commitment, her strength, her witness to Jesus as a servant of the gospel. Jesus gave her not merely healing from a fever, but a whole new life to live among the family of disciples. The others from the city crowded around her door, wanting that too. And Jesus was busy, busy, seeing, hearing, touching, healing, making the world over into the kingdom of God on earth. Oof, I feel like I need a nap. Jesus is moving so fast. 
I'm not sure I can keep up. He's just been going, going, going from healing that woman in the morning to, to healing people in the night that, all over the city. I would think that must have been exhausting for him. People's needs and expectations and demands, that kind of stuff is always tiring for me. And yet the scripture says that he was up again before dawn, going out to a dark, quiet place to pray. A quiet place to pray certainly makes sense. He would need time alone with God to be refreshed in his spirit. He would need to receive after a day where he was just giving, 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 giving time, giving attention, giving healing to everyone else. But his respite sure didn't last very long. Soon the disciples find Jesus and tell him, everybody's looking for you. More people in the same town want something from him. It's not possible that he could have seen everybody in just one night. But we're still in Mark's gospel, and here Jesus is on the move. Dawn is barely breaking, and he's off to the next town to do the same thing all over again. Announce the arrival of God's kingdom and show its powerful presence by healing people and casting out demons and making people's lives new, making the world new, one person, one community, one city at a time. Who is this Jesus, then, that we find in Mark's gospel? This Jesus that we are going to be hearing about and learning about and following in scripture readings for the next year. This Jesus has an urgency about him, an urgency to share with us. It started back in verse 15 of chapter 1 when he showed up preaching the good news of God and saying, the time is at hand. The kingdom of God has drawn near. Repent, turn, wake up, and believe the good news. That's what is so urgent. In Jesus, God's kingdom is here. The good news is here. It's time to wake up and believe the good news. It's so easy to believe the bad news whatever form that takes. Immigrants are the problem. No, the rich are the problem. No, the politicians are the problem. Anyone but us is the problem. The world is burning up. No, there's nothing wrong with the world. Maybe there's no hope for the world. All of these things are certainly issues that need our attention and our involvement for sure, but you know, it's just so easy to believe the bad news, the worst news possible that's out there, the worst news about ourselves or about our neighbors or about what's going to happen tomorrow and next year. But I wonder if we're able to turn and open our eyes and believe the good news that Jesus is real, that the kingdom is here, that God is at work among us, that we have not been abandoned, that despite the genuine difficulties we face, there is hope for the future, for our future, for the planet's future, for the future of all people, citizens, immigrants, politicians, the rich, the poor, women, children, men, caring for one another as Jesus has shown us how to care with respect and honesty and decency and love. That's what the gospel calls us to do. That's what Jesus calls us to do. And Jesus isn't waiting around. He's on the move. He's going, 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 trampling down evil, establishing mercy, bringing love and healing everywhere he goes, coming to this town, bringing love and mercy and truth to your house, coming with all of his good gifts to our neighbors, coming through you and me, through us together, right here, right now, with the kingdom of God in his person in us. And that's good news that we can believe. Amen.